Animals have evolved a remarkable range of traits. Animals live in a diverse and incredibly complex set of different environments. And within those environments, they employ features that enable appropriate behaviours to be performed. Hello everyone, my name is Dr Paul Rose and in this short video I'd like to explain some of the differences between natural and sexual selection and I'm going to do that by using a range of natural history artefacts that I have in my own kind of geeky natural history collection. So I'd like to talk a bit about traits that we see in animals that are naturally selected which convey an adaptive or a fitness benefit to individuals within the population. So natural selection works at a species level and it drives to make that population fitter and more evolved to a particular habitat. So the animals or the individuals within the habitat can best survive and breed in the future. And I'd like to compare that to some examples of sexually selected traits which convey an advantage for an individual's lifetime reproductive success. They don't necessarily enhance the individual's longevity, but what they do do is enable those individuals that possess them to be more successful at attracting or finding a partner and therefore have a greater influence over the genetic qualities of the future generation. So there are some classic examples that we commonly find in the textbooks around natural selection and sexual selection and some of those species will make an appearance in this video. So we're all familiar with the peacock and we're all familiar with the peacock's train and the eye spots on the peacock's train are one of these clacky examples of a sexually selected response. So we've got a range of different colours and patterns as well as different structures to the feathers that are used for the peacock's courtship display. So this is again a classic example of sexual selection. Behind those train feathers are these dowdy but more structurally important plumes and these help support the tail when the peacock raises his train. So here we've got sexual selection and here we've got natural selection. So we've got two examples of an adaptive trait within the same species. We have got these stronger or supportive feathers that without them the peacock wouldn't be able to raise his train to perform his courtship display. The train of the peacock is incredibly long and these feathers are almost as tall as me and this is a classic example of sexual selection although as I've said previously we're still not completely aware of their function or their single function but we know that they do have a role in mate choice and they are used by the peahen in some capacity to help choose a partner and you can see the differences in colour that is exhibited by these peacock train feathers as they catch the light. So imagine much more of these feathers all grouped together in the peacock's train. That's a real big handicap for the bird to carry around and it's something that's obviously going to influence that individual's longevity, fitness as well as his breeding success throughout the course of his life. So classic example of something where evolution has made this not for the adaptive capabilities of the animal to survive in its habitat but for something that's definitely going to show off his abilities at actually being a really really fit and strong individual that's going to make the best breeding partner. You wouldn't evolve this to keep you safe in the wild. Long tail feathers are not just a feature of the peacock, they're a feature of many different birds and again they can have different functions based on the habitat or the environment that the animal finds itself in as well as the role that the feather plays to the bird's behaviour. Parrots for example, these are the tail feathers of a blue and gold macaw. These incredibly long plumes help guide the animal whilst it's flying. They have a really good support and balance but they have a very really long rudder for when it's flying through the rainforest. And also, because parrots like to climb, they're very, very good at climbing with their beak and their feet, 
if you're climbing around at the tops of trees and very thin or very narrow perches and you want to maintain your balance so do these long plumes enable you to maintain your balance and you can tell this is a tail feather because it's equal along the central shaft down the middle of the feather we've got equal filaments on this side and we've got equal filaments on that side so this type of feather is clearly designed for posture orientation or balance let's compare that to another tail feather this is a tail feather from a golden pheasant it's relatively long and it has less structure than what we can see in the macaw tail feathers the macaw tail feather is relatively rigid the golden pheasant feather is quite floppy this is another example of courtship display this is very very similar to the peacock's train so this is another handicap principle where we've got the individual growing this long train this long plume sorry but for the same reason why the peacock grows his train to use this in his courtship display to impress the female the peacock is not the only species of bird to take advantage of what we call ocelli or eye spots on these display plumes um, this rather moth-eaten example is from an argus pheasant and you can see the row of eye spots that is used in the male's courtship display. Argus pheasants have the most incredible display where the male basically turns his wings around the wrong way to show off this dazzling array of eye spots to the female. And Argus, the Greek god of eyes, is where the bird gets its name from. And then these are the display plumes of the grey peacock pheasant. Um, clue in its name, it's got eye spots on its plumes just the same as we see in the peacock. So the Argus pheasant, the peacock pheasant, and the peacock itself are all employing a very similar type of behavior based on the anatomy and the structure of their feathers the color and patterning of their feather are all conveying a similar message to the female i'm a good quality mate i can put on a really good courtship display and therefore you should choose me to be the father of your offspring That long rigid tail that we saw in the macaw is mirrored in even smaller parrots too. These are the tail feathers of a budgerigar. This is one of the world's largest parrots. This is one of the world's smallest parakeets. Yet the function of the tail feather is exactly the same. So within family resemblances, habitat similarities, behavioural ecology similarities, the same evolutionary pressures are exacting the same forces on the traits those animals possess because they need to be doing the same type of behaviour. Long rigid tail in the rainforest, long-ish rigid tail in the Australian bush. The birds fulfil a similar ecological function, therefore their feathers need to do the same thing. So this is natural selection. Birds can use their tail feathers for display without those tail feathers being full of ornate coloration or patterning or eye spots. These are the bustle feathers, which I think is a brilliant word, of a red crown crane. So cool because when all of these feathers are together, they reminded scientists of the bustle, the dress style in Victorian ladies. Red crown cranes have a very elaborate courtship display. They jump up and down, spreading their wings out, throwing sticks around. And it's a very lifelong partnership between the male and female, which is reinforced by this dancing every year. So the red crown crane's bustle feather has to be part of that courtship dance. It has to add to that courtship dance. But because they have this lifelong bond, they don't need to attract a new mate every year. So unlike the dancing of the peacock, they don't need to grow the elaborate colours and patterns which is molted every year and then regrown for the next breeding season because all their feathers need to do is to show their show of strength and fitness and faithfulness to their mate so the trait here is still sexually selected this helps the cranes perform their courtship dance but in a slightly different way to the sexual selection that has evolved the peacock's tail feathers
but when a feature works well, when it's under the control of natural selection that has enabled it to be successful across species, you will see that feature be highly conserved across different types of animal. If we look at the flight feathers of birds, this is a swan, this is a buzzard, this is a parrot, and this very long feather is from a vulture. You can see that they all have a similar feature. They're all asymmetrical around the central shaft of the feather. We've got more filaments, more barbs on this side than we have on that side. This makes the feather aerodynamic. It gives the leading edge of the wing an ability to gain lift and therefore it keeps the bird in the air. So regardless of your type of bird, swan, buzzard, parrot or vulture, you have this same aerodynamic shape to your flight feathers because evolution, the, the way in which the feather has evolved to fit on the bird wing, generates the best possible amount of lift. So this shape makes the bird as aerodynamic, as streamlined and as efficient as possible in flight and that's why all of these flight feathers look exactly the same. So let's put all of that together and look at the anatomy of a bird's wing. This is a duck's wing. Don't worry, it didn't die for the purposes of this video. You can see the long primary feathers. They're asymmetrical. They all fit together to give this nice leading edge. Then we've got these patches of colour here, particularly this reflective green patch that is used for communication between individuals when they're flying. So the different feather structures and colours have a different role to play in that behaviour. The primary feathers keep the bird in the air. These brighter coloured feathers here, including the reflective green patch, which we call a speculum, allow individuals to see the movement patterns of others and can communicate with each other whilst they're in flight. So wing anatomy is really naturally selected. It has evolved for the bird's behaviours based on the ecology of the habitat that the animal fits into and the things that it needs to do with its wings. If we look at my duck, which is a long distance flyer, we've got this long wing that's capable of carrying it very fast over large distances. In the case of this tawny owl, I hope you can see that the wing looks a bit more fluffy. There's got an, a leading edge to the wing that is not as smooth as in the duck. And if we look across the feathers of the owl, we can see that this edge to them, this kind of serrated edge almost, allows the animal to fly silently by disrupting the air patterns as the bird flies along, which gives it silent flight. So the behavioural ecology of the owl has caused the wing shape to look like this with a particular feather structure, and the behavioural ecology of the duck has caused the wing shape and feather structure to look like this. Same basic design, but different principles to allow for different life history strategies. Birds use pigments for very many different things in their feathers. These red feathers are from the Turaco, which is an African fruit-eating bird from the tropical rainforests. Turaco feathers are unique in that their pigments within their feathers, these red pigments, are copper-based. And that's a very unusual thing to find. And these copper-based pigments are used by the birds for communication between individuals in the rainforest. And we can see these different types of pigments being really, really important for individual species based on their natural ecology and what messages they need to convey to other individuals. And birds that might appear really colourful actually in their natural habitat can blend in with their surroundings. These are the feathers from Amazon parrots. Now a parrot might look incredibly colourful if you see it in a cage or an aviary, but actually in its natural environment where it blends in with the dappled light of the rainforest, this mixture of colours, these greens, blues, oranges and yellows, break up the outline of the bird and make it very difficult for predators to spot in dense green leaves within rainforest trees. So these and these 
are naturally selected traits that enable the animal to best fit within its natural habitat to live for as long as possible and to be as successful as possible keeping itself alive finding enough food communicating with others as it possibly can within its natural environment in some species we're really, really confused about why they have particular colours or structures of colour in their feathers. These are the feathers from a roller, another African species of bird. Rollers are real aerial acrobats and they can perform the most amazing different types of manoeuvres whilst they're in the air. I like to think that these look like they've been dipped in two different shades of blue. And again, like the Turaco, it may be that these particular types of colour are really useful for communication and visual signalling between individuals whilst they're moving around their natural habitat. So this would be an example of a naturally selected trait. Some types of pigment directly come from diet. I've got three different types of pink feather here. This is from a roseate spoonbill, this is from a Caribbean flamingo, and this is from a scarlet ibis. But what they all have in common is the pink pigment within the feather comes directly from the bird's diet. It's a carotenoid pigment and carotenoids are the same types of chemicals that we find in carrots. They give carrots their orange colours. These carotenoids that come directly from diet are a direct reflection of the bird's qualities as forager. That means this is an honest signal. The pink of my feathers, the better I am at foraging and therefore the better quality individual I am. So not only have we got a sexually selected trait, look at how good a quality I am, you should come and breed with me, but we've also got a naturally selected trait because lots of these carotenoid rich foods can be toxic. So by shunting that chemical into your feathers, you get it out of your body and consequently, the toxic side effects of eating that diet don't have any effect on you. So honest signals, can be displayed to individuals within a social group based on the colour of their feathers. It's really easy to work out the natural selection properties of some types of features that animals have. In this little petri dish here, I've got some penguin feathers. These penguin feathers are tiny, and when they all fit together on the bird itself, it's almost like the penguin is wearing its own duvet. So these tiny feathers trap air next to the body, keep the penguin uh, warm, and also waterproof when it's underwater. So penguins have many, many thousands of these little feathers and consequently they have evolved because of the very chilly uh, environment that penguins live in. But we also see these insulation properties of feathers in other species as well. Another flightless bird, the rhea, which is the South American equivalent of the ostrich. Rheas have these beautiful long plumes. They lack the structure that we see in flighted birds. So if you look at my spoonbill feather, you can see that all of the filaments are zipped together by barbs between the feathers themselves. This creates a beautiful, smooth, aerodynamic edge to the feather. The rear, being flightless, doesn't have that. The filaments are all loose and the feather is really floppy. This keeps the bird warm by acting like thatch. So all of these feathers sit on top of each other and basically form a protective layer against the elements, just like the thatching material that we use in old fashioned cottages. And we can see that across different species of flightless birds. In emus, for example, we have this very strange two pronged approach. Each feather has two shafts that come off the central base. And again, when we put all of these feathers together, we can create a thatch like structure which helps keep the bird insulated. And therefore, that's the best way that the bird can ensure it maintains homeostasis without having to oil or preen its feathers in the same way as flighted birds do. They still look after their feathers, 
they still preen them and keep them clean and tidy, but they don't have to worry about keeping them oiled and waterproof for flight, so the feather has evolved a different structure. I've talked a lot about birds so far in my examples of sexual selection, but obviously it's not just birds that show the processes of sexual selection in the traits they carry. This is seen across a whole range of species in the natural world. And one of the species that is most incredible, I suppose, in the sexually selected traits that it carries is one that we can find close to home in this country. It's the stag beetle. These are two dead specimens. They don't live very long as adults. So if you live around London or in the southeast um, in the summertime, June and July, you might be able to pick up the, the spent cases, as it were, of the beetles themselves at the end of their breeding season. Stag beetles have these huge mandibles, these huge jaw-like appendages, which they use for the purposes of courtship display. The males grapple with each other to show strengths with each other and therefore control access to the females. So those appendages, those enormous jaws, are not for feeding, they're nothing to do with foraging behaviours, they're purely sexually selected. The female stag beetle is much smaller. Here she is, and she lacks any of those mandibles, she lacks that jaw. So consequently, the traits that are developed by the males are purely for sexual selection, purely for impressing her, and consequently, it's almost the insect example of the peacock's train. The stag beetle spends a very long time as a grub for a number of years eating rotten wood. So if you have old forests with lots of fallen trees, with lots of dead wood around, you'll find stag beetles. This male is much larger than this male. And we've got these size differences even within the same population of the same species. And that's partly dependent on the nutrition, the quality of bark that the animal was eating when it was a youngster. So that's going to have an effect on its courtship display, on the size of its appendages, and therefore on its likelihood of, of being more successful by attracting females. And then we've got this, which is the antler of a fallow deer. His calcified bone grows deciduously, so that means it's regrown and shed each year. The deer has two of these on top of his head, and this is only a small specimen, but it's still relatively weighty. So like the peacock's train, we've got something that is a real investment in the animal. It's something that is going to be costly to produce and costly to maintain, and will have other costs based on how he can move around the habitat, his foraging efficiency, the likelihood he can run away from predators, or so he can compete with other males for the best access to females. So this type of ornamentation, which we see in these animals that are directly competing with each other for females, is another example of a sexually selected trait. You can see at the bottom of this antler, the attachment where the antler would grow out of the skull. And you might be able to see the little indentations in the base of the antler which is where the blood supply would flow into the growing bone. So the deer has to eat a lot over the summer, fresh grazing, which gives it the most energy. Sweetest sugar rich grass and young leaves are gonna be put in in a very short space of time to growing this. So the foraging efficiency of the deer also has an influence on the strength and quality of his antlers you can see this antler has been used. It's damaged and scarred by combat with other males. So let's hope that this was a successful stag after putting all the investment in to growing two of these on the top of his head. And then we've got some extreme examples of shapes and sizes. These are the sail feathers from a mandarin duck. He uses these purely for courtship display. They are orange with a beautiful blue bottom which catches the light. This 
like the stag's antlers and like the mandibles on the stag beetle and like the peacock's train is a lot of investment these are grown new every breeding season and the mandarin uses these in his courtship display so that he can impress to the females with a range of movements that he makes around the female that he wants to breed with because the mandarin invests in these feathers just like the peacock so he's compromising his own effects at longevity and attempts at evading predators purely to show off that he's a good quality mate so again this is a sexually selected trait that is purely for the purposes of courtship display and breeding you can now see that the features possessed by different species of animal are under the pressures from natural selection which ensures that population that species as a whole can survive as best possible under prevailing conditions. Sexual selection is a form of natural selection which promotes the likelihood of an individual having the best possible lifetime reproductive success and consequently individuals will have traits that don't necessarily enhance longevity but will enhance their chances of being successful during mating and breeding.